So, I wonder if everyone's as exhausted as I am. Yeah. I want to first start. Um, my wife and I always uh, need to apologize, and we feel the need to apologize if um, during the last few days I brushed anyone off as I was trying to get to the bathroom. I never knew walking from the stairs to the uh, dining room should take an hour. But I honestly, I feel terrible because I recognize that, uh, you know, just 30 seconds, just a minute, and I just, uh, I, there wasn't time. And I apologize for that. And if I uh, insulted anyone, I asked Michaela. The resilient family, the subject is the resilient family. I'm going to make another Akdoma that I have been thinking a lot about. Uh, before I say this, there are four different areas I want to talk about in developing and building a resilient family as the component of the marriage, the component of the chinuch of our children, the personal component of our own growth, and then our religious, spiritual growth. These four areas I would like to look at. In the past, when I've talked about marriage, and I made it sound like, unless you have a good marriage, somehow you're not going to help your children. I'd like to withdraw that notion. I'd like to acknowledge, I've actually thought very, very deeply about it, about those that are divorced, those who are single, who don't have a couple to work with, a marriage couple, and of course those who are in a marriage that doesn't lend itself at the moment to the things that I'm going to describe. I would second marriages. Any more? Did I miss anything? Have I covered them? What I'm trying to say is this. What is occurring to me more and more is that Kaddish Baruch Hu puts us in situations that are appropriate to where our Nisianus and spiritual growth lie. I've actually thought it's a a little different than I've ever thought before, in that those of us that are in a marriage where we should be and could be working better together have a, an obligation to do so, to take and utilize that marriage, if we can, for the sake of our children for their development and their growth. Those who don't have it have a different God-given way to bring that to their children. So when I talk about, as I'm going to talk about marriage, chas v'shalem for any person who isn't, who doesn't fit the model of a marriage that I'm going to describe, chas v'shalem to feel that somehow you've missed out. There's no such thing. It's simply a different dynamic that would apply to you than it would apply to someone who does that, that opportunity and, dare I say, responsibility. So I'm addressing, when I talk about marriage, the responsibility of those of us that are in a marriage that we can tweak, that we can focus differently on, for the sake of our families, I'm addressing that. I hope that makes sense and it's more respectful. What is the primary obligation for us in using our marriage for our children, for our lives, is the obligation to create safety for our children. What we've talked about the entire weekend and for now many, many, many Keshe Nafshi conferences, 
is understanding that what our children are dealing with is a reaction to trauma. And as we know, trauma disconnects. They're always running away. They're always going from. One thing is clear to me watching this over the years, and this applies whether you're married or you're single, it makes no difference, that the desire of the children to want to be close to us, that desire internally is what can and usually does facilitate their desire to be affected by the outside world, mentors, teachers, rebellion, programs, meetings, whatever is going to affect them to help them think through their lives and think twice about how, what my future is going to look like. It's when we create safety in our homes then they want to be in that home. They see a picture, a future, in which they project about one day with their life, with their marriage, with their children, with their future, whatever their future may look like, they want that future to be aligned with us if we create safety. Creating safety is the crucial issue that frees that process internally in in inside our children, that they will then be able to absorb whatever's going on in them around their life, which is usually not us. It is not us as parents who have those profound, deep, life-altering conversations with our children where they suddenly wake up and heal from all their drama. That doesn't happen. We don't do that. We facilitate. We create the potential for that to occur wherever it may occur, whether it's in an AA meeting, an SA meeting, it's in a program, it's a mentor on the street, it's someone working with them, it's someone out there. We facilitate that by creating safety in our homes because they're running from, remember that always, the experience they have is fear and hurt and they're running away. And unfortunately, almost all of us, and I want to be very careful about this, almost all of us, I say for myself, 100% myself, made many mistakes before we started working out how to do this right. We all made mistakes. We all became part of that running away from for our children before we got it right. I don't believe any of us just like naturally got it perfectly right the first time. No such thing. I think we made a lot of mistakes because we didn't know. Because we simply didn't know, which means that we are, we are a component of that which our children are running from. We're deep in there too. So creating safety in our homes is crucial. For those of us that are married, that means and have the potential to work with your spouse to elevate safety. Think of the word safety. When you go home, think of the word safety. How do we create safety for our children? How do we create an environment where they don't feel criticized, knocked, threatened, put down, complained about, where we don't do that to each other, husband and wife, and snipe at each other? Think about safety. Just think about that word. Am I creating safety in the world around me, in the environment of my home? Do I make People feel safe in this home. By the way I speak, by the way I act, by the way I look, by the tone of my voice, by my non-reactiveness to little inconsistencies and you know, kids' behavior, do I create safety in how I interact with them and how I interact with my spouse? Think the word safety. Number two. 
create a space for love. What does that mean, create a space for love? Nobody, I've never met anyone yet, likes being controlled. No one likes being told what to do. I always say that on Shavuos we get Shnei Sorem, right? We go on for Nasa, Klal Yisrael got one for Nasa, one for Nishma. So it's a very interesting Shaila. We got one for Nasa, makes sense. You know, Kodesh Baruch Hu says do it. I don't understand it. I don't know what it means. Never learned anything about it. But I say yes. Okay. Klal Yisrael got a crown for that. But if you're already doing it, why do you get a crown for Nishma? The whole point of Nishma is to learn what to do. You're doing it anyway. So why stake sorry? Why do you get a crown for Nishma? And I think the pithy answer to that is because when you do Nishma, you discover you have to do it. You're chayiv, and nobody likes being told what to do. Create a space for love. You create a space for love by letting go of any control or expectation or requirement of your spouse. God la mitzvah misha'enu mitzvah because it's harder to do it when you're told to do it. It's the old kasha that everyone says, the wide of the, you know, ladies are always waiting for your husband to do the right thing. It's like a long wait for most women. And the pal is, why don't you tell him? Like, just let him know. Do this, I'll feel loved. No? It was like some Robertson's convention once where you all decided, Yerva, we do not tell our husbands how to love us. They got to work it out. What's for sure that? There's a real tifa, tifa sod that I think is in the Matthias of Noshim that they get, they understand. Because if I would tell him, if I would tell him, well, how do I really know I'm loved? How do I really know? But if he worked it out, if he chabbed, then I feel it, then I feel love. Create a space for love. It means stop telling each other what to do, making each other chayiv to do things. Don't complain about why don't you do this, why you're doing that. Don't do this, don't do that. Don't demand and expect. Ask. If you can, I'd appreciate it. If you can't, that's fine too. Creating a space for love is giving each other the opportunity not to do it. I can manage. It's fine. But if you can, I'd appreciate it. Because then when your spouse steps forward into that space, willingly and gladly, you feel loved and cared for because they didn't have to do it. And you told them you don't have to do it. It's fine. It goes from the little trivial to the great things. For all things in life, if we create a space for love, then love can occur in that space. And if we demand and require, so you may get your needs met, but you will not feel loved. Our children need to experience the experience of love. They need to see it and feel it. So Bermuda, that we're able to do this, that's in conjunction with safety. It's creating a home that they will want to be part of. Create a space for love. And lastly, in your marriage, you have to ask yourself the question every day. Personally, you know, it's like after Shachas, you know, when you have your first coffee of the day, make a time when you can consistently ask this question. What do I value more, my ego or my relationship? Make a time once a day to ask that question. What do I value more, my ego or my relationship? Do I want to be right? Do I need so badly to be right? Or do I value my relationship more importantly than I have to be right? What gets in the way of almost all of us in our relationships is ourselves. We perceive it's the spouse. 
We think it's their behavior, it's their hanhaga. Each of us has to be makabal that it's a hundred percent me. That means a hundred percent of my stuff is mine. And I hope that my spouse will engage themselves and see a hundred percent of their stuff is theirs. That's what it means to get your ego out the way, to value the relationship more than you value your ego. It's so much better to let go of being right, but to have love in your life. And I can tell you again that what our children, our children crave is to witness and experience that love, that loving home and that, that relationship. So make a time, I recommend, once a day to simply reflect upon that thought. Do I put my relationship before my ego? Have I done that work on myself yet? When I reflect on the day gone by, on yesterday, the day before, and ask yourself, did my ego get in the way again? And if it did, can I make a commitment to try and stop that today? And have a better day. Yeah. Chinuch Abonim. Basic Yisoydus of Chinuch Abonim. We talked, you know, in, chin, in crisis Chinuch training, those of you that have seen it, I imagine everyone has, we always start with the mitzvah L'Shevis Yitzar. This mitzvah, the other half of Piria Viribya. Kaddish Baruch commanded we have children, so that's a mitzvah, Piri Rivia. But actually the Chinuch says the other half of that mitzvah is the mitzvah of L'Shevis Yitzhara. L'Sho Bara L'Shevis Yitzhara. Kaddish Baruch did not create the world, the Pesach says, Yishayo, to be empty, but to be filled with people. And what type of people? So I consistently say, I check this out with various Rabbanu if they agree with me, the mitzvah L'Shevis is to bring a child into this world that is healthy in body, healthy in mind, happy, capable of self-love, and capable of loving others. That's the myth of the Shabbos. That means our focus, our primary focus was meant to be, when we had little children, not the installation of mitzvahs, pre, prior to the installation of mitzvahs, then he chiv to get them to do mitzvahs, the chiyuv, the responsibility Hashem gave us, was to bring up healthy children, healthy in body and mind, happy, capable of self-love, capable of loving others. That's what we all should have done had we known it. And we would have known also that when in the early years there was ever a contradiction between the installation of a mitzvah or creating a healthy human being, we should have been taught back off of the installation of a mitzvah, never compromise in the early years the development of a healthy human being at the expense of doing an installation of a mitzvah. It won't work. It'll be a mazik in the long run. Well, I mention this again because in crisis chinuch, what we're doing is going back to that basic, think about it, Everything we do in the way we interact with our children should be, our children, should be to develop in them the feeling of healthy and body and mind, happy, capable of self-love, capable of loving others. That's our mandate. As Rav Schwartz said this morning, and the Paskin of Paskin again and again and again, the Chiyuv, to make, there is no Chiyuv. After bar mitzvah, bas mitzvah, we have no chiv to get our kids to do mitzvahs. That's the chiv bezdin, to make them do mitzvahs. But we go back to the mitzvah of Lishabbos. That's our mitzvah. And if we can go home with that in mind, that the primary goal, forget about mitzvahs, that's on them, that's their life. Mitzvahs will be a trigger for them. Mitzvahs will make them run from again. So people say to me, so what am I meant to do? Just do nothing? 
And it's a crazy thought because there's a world to do, a world. And that's the world of L'Shevis Yitzhara. That's the world of helping our child through the way we treat them, interact with them, behave with them, feel with them, live with them, that we develop healthy human beings. We go back to the basics. That's our mitzvah. Equally so, people have often said to me, and I made a mistake, I've corrected it now, thanks to, I always like feedback, by the way, anything you feel I could do better, email me, tell me how. Please. No, I mean it. I, 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 it's like ludicrous that you would think I would not enjoy that. Why wouldn't I enjoy that to do the job better? So please email me. Just tell me. What's my email address? Gedalia Miller. <laughs> but I'm honest, I'm quite honest about it. Anything, if I lack clarity, I work so hard to be precise and to give clarity to these ideas and make them simple. But if you feel I could set it better or it was confusing, email me. Tell me. It's a pleasure. So one of the mistakes I made is I've left audiences hurting sometimes, conflicted and hurting, because I love dashing about the four S's, right? This is one of the, this was actually right here at Keshenavshi in the Raleigh Hotel, the first Keshenavshi conference. Those of you who remember who were here, I spoke about this the first time, and I saw the reaction. It was the first time I spoke about it publicly, and I watched the reaction of the people here, and it was just it just captured everything. The four S's, safe, secure, seen, and soothe. I took it from Dan Siegel, you know, from Parenting the Inside Out. And it's like I said, he kind of just like mentions it. To me, it's a basis. It's a binion. It's profound. You see in the book, I make a big fuss about it. But here's where I think I hurt people. Because I left people thinking, well, okay, so I wrecked my life. I wrecked my kids. I didn't do them. Now what? Right, and a lot of people felt like very despondent as if I'm reading this material, I'm getting more depressed every day. Here's the beautiful thing about the four S's, and I'd like you to take this home with you. This is how I do it in therapy. The four S's are not just a preventive developmental model for how to create resilient children. They're a reparative model model. They're a reparative model. I use that model clinically with my clients all the time. I do it both with the children who did not receive it and with their parents who didn't know about it or give it enough or couldn't. It's reparative. Don't get sabrachan if you didn't do it. On the contrary, Focus on it. I process it with my clients. Let's go through the four S's. Let's see which one was missing in the way you parented your children. Let's take it. Let's use it. Let's build it. Let's attempt to see if we can find a way to interact with the kids with that S. Let's see which one was missing. Even with the kids who were not recipients, if you're an adult child who for sure didn't receive it, hands up everyone because we all didn't get it, right? Let's be honest. How many of us got the four S's? I'm lucky. I got the four S's from my mother. She gave me. I got all four. You knew my mother. I got the four S's. I'm one of those people who got it. My father, I got two. He didn't have the other two. There are a few people, but most of us didn't get them. I, I, I hardly know a human being on earth who both parents gave more four S's. You can repay yourself. You can work through which one was missing for me. And work through how to get that in a healthy way in your life. The four S's are reparative. They're not just rep- preventive. So please don't walk away sabrachan if you feel, ah, oh, I didn't get, I didn't do, I messed up. Now start. <clears throat> Go home on the drive home and think about, I wonder which of the four S's I really missed in bringing up my kids. I wonder which one. And let me see if I can work on that this week or this month. And every month, work on another one and think how to apply it more with your children. We're creating safety. We're bringing them home. We're reconnecting them. We can rebuild resilience. 
we could repair the damage. There's a fascinating, listen to this, talking about Chinuch and our Choyip, if only we had known this, and then I'm going to try and explain it, how we're going to apply it. But there's a fascinating Gemara, Nozir, Kof Ches base. So the Mishnah says in Nozir that a father is allowed to impose Nazirus on his child. I read mean, good So much like us, why? There's two different opinions. So one opinion, Rabbi Yechelen Rish Lakish. Rabbi Yechelen says, Salach HaMosh HaMosinai. Salach HaMosh HaMosinai has the right to impose Nazirus on his child, and he could do it. And according to Rish Lakish, it's Kedai Lahan Choy B'Mitzvahs. He wants to be mechalechim in mitzvahs. I mean, it's going to make him into a nazir. He'll make him very from. You know, he'll, he'll get him kedusha. We'll pull out kedusha. And that's not cynical. I'm not being funny or cynical. It's that they're trying to, that's, that's the expression of what the Gemara means. So the Gemara goes on to say something fascinating. It says that if the kravim, the relatives, want to be Moicha and say, no, he's not the Kabul, he's not a Nazir. The uncles, aunts, Baba Zaders, who knows, relatives, come along and they look at the situation and they say, no, 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 he's not a Nazir, they have the right to do so. They can stop the Nazirus. So they go and say something amazing. It says, okay, according to Rabbi Yechelen, it says, Allah HaMosh Messinai, so they also get the right, halacha, Moshe, Messinai, to be Moshe. But according to Rish Lakish, who says, the Gemara says, there's Kedei Lachancha Mitzvahs, what right do the Kroivim have to come along and interfere with the father's obligation and right to be Mechanach, his child in Mitzvahs? So, Frank the Gemara. So, Gemara gives an answer. Listen to the answer of the Gemara. Kasabar. Kol chinuch de chashiv. Any chinuch that's not chashiv. Chashiv. We're going to leave that word alone for the moment. But chashiv. We don't know what chashiv means. Kol chinuch de chashiv. Lo nichale. It's not good. If the chinuch's not chashiv, it's not important. It's not special. It's not meaningful. Lo nichale. It's not good for him. So listen to what Tosis says. It's amazing, Tosis. So Tosis says, "Kasava kol chinuch to lechashiv, kedo chinuch nazirus." If it's not lechashiv, why do bezirinu? Do megalech sarei belo nichalei hilchi chachal limchais. First pshat Tosis, he says, because you're going to shave off all his hair afterwards, and that's a bezoyin for the child. It's a bezoyin for him, and therefore lo nichalei. It's not nice for him, so it. That they're allowed to be Moicha. But then Tyson says, Vyesh Garson, listen to this Lashon, it's amazing. Vyesh Garson, the second Shan Tyson. Deloy Chashivi, what does it mean, Kalchinach Deloy Chashivi? Vahachi Pirushai, this is what it means. Kalchinach, the whole act of Chinach, and here we're talking about the generic term of bringing up our children. Chinach. Educating, bringing them up to be healthy human beings in Yidden. Kol Hinuch Hu Lehachshivai is to make him feel Chashuv. It's not Kol Hinuch, the Lachashiv is not Chashuv for him. It's, look at the Lashon, Kol Hinuch Hu Lehachshivai, Vizebizyoinu Hulai, Mishuachi. They can be Meicha. Chinuch is to make him feel good about himself. Lahach Shivoi, says Tysus. That's the, uh, we're not talking about the Meisa Chinuch, no, move away from that. We're talking about the whole idea of parenting. All of parenting is Lahach Shivoi, to make him feel special, to make him feel good. 
to make him feel harshuv. That's our job as parents. They can be moifer because it's a bizoyant for him. It's a bizoyant to cut off his hair. It doesn't look nice. He's going to grow long hair and cut off his hair. It's disgusting. The kid will feel like, like ridiculous. Chinuf, what we're doing with our children is lahachshivai, to make them feel special. Chinuf isn't about us, our egos, about some sort of God-given obligation to make a robot. Chinuf with our children is to take these precious souls we brought into this world and make them feel chashuv. What I'd like to suggest is that's what our parenting is. That's what we should be doing. We should be looking at our children and asking ourselves, how can I I make him feel special? How can I make him feel special? It's about him. It's about her. It's not about me. How can I separate my ego so much that when I look at my child, it's about you or it's not about me? It's not about me feeling good about myself. I can stand in shawl and I've got a little six-year-old shuckling his head off so I can feel chashuv. It's about him feeling chashuv. We have to shift our hearts and souls where we look at our children and what we're trying to do is help them feel special in this world. They should feel chashuv. That's really the Yisad And Maybe we should go home now thinking about that when I look at my children. How do I make them feel awesome? How do I make them feel special? How do I interact with them, especially when I have to put a little rules or structure around them, but I do it in a way that's respectful, that makes them feel special as a human being. It's not about control. It's not about making them into robots. It's about making them feel chashuv. Listen to this chasm song. I'm going to tell you chasm say for this. Awesome. Mom, I'm going to read it to you. It's a piece. It's a shtickle tire, but it's so profound. Chasm Soifa brings down in the Droish uh, Hesped. Pashas Chukas Tof Kuf Ayn Ches Droish Shin Pei. He dashes a posok. He brings this down. Actually, this is from. Uh, he brings this down from a uh, the Masa Shekel lost a child, and he said the drosh, and he quotes the Masa Shekel. Chasim Sofer in Doyusha Posok Posok Gaelis Elacha Eretz. Shemalkecha nar, besarecha beboika yechelo. I'm going to translate. Elchayes oy ve for a country. Shemalkecha nar, the melech is a child, a small child. Oy ve for a country where the king died and the the prince became the king and he's a child. Besarecha beboika yechelo, and his ministers. Eat breakfast. I'm translating literally. Strange pasuk. I vey for a country where the king became a king. He was a child. The serecha beboika yechelu. Pasuk in Kohelis. Ministers eat breakfast. What's pshat? This is how he touches it. It's a small piece. I'm going to read it to you because the lashon is kaidish and it's beautiful and it makes a point that's so profound. Listen to this. It's a small piece. It means oy ve for a country that the ministers eat breakfast. It's oy ve for that, not oy ve that the king became a king when he was young. Shlomo Melech became a king when he was a child. He was 12. He was just a child. And the country benefited. The world, Klalisol, benefited in an amazing, amazing way from Shlomo Melech, the king. So it can't be the Oyvei for a country whose king is a nar goes on that. It's Oyvei 
for a country whose king is not who the Sarecha Baboka Yachaylo. That's where it's Oyve on that. What does it mean? Acha Odom Betibo Aine Nu Malach. A person's nature is not to be a Malach. The Efsha, for Shulaifen, Shuloya Sikhe Rasikhas Ayaldus. It's impossible that a child will not be childish. It's not shaykh. Bifrat hacham godla, mosev das, mosev lemacham begaz. And the person that's a child that's a smart child is going to be very smart in his childishness. He's going to drive you crazy. Valkulze, nevertheless, yamdu sorov v'zikneinov, Nevertheless, the ministers of the king and the skenim of the city, of the country, v'yachso lover, v'yachso olov, v'yachso psachta, al kol mikshoilov, they put a plaster, a band-aid on all his stupidity. They cover up his stupidity. They hide it. Ad avionum el mekaimo haroi malosum adregeso hagadoyla. And they cover it up till he matures, till he becomes older and he can have self-control. They cover it up for him. They hide it. They shield him. When he takes the scepter and he starts throwing it in the air and twiddling it, they grab it and they walk him aside and they give him a fake scepter. Here, take the plastic one. You know, tell you this one, you know. And he starts with the crown. No, 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 no. And it's, you know, and they, they shield him. They protect him. From his own childishness, it's impossible he can't be a child because he's a child. And then, wow, how wonderful, how gewaldic that generation is when he eventually matures and he becomes the Chacham Mikolodom, he becomes the king because they protected him from his own childishness. Ah, however, Eilecha Eretz, oy vey for a country, she'im zochisa lamelech nar, they were zoicha to have a young king, a prince at a young age, became the king. Ah, sarecha shesvivov beboika shalai, the ministers that were around him in his boika, his childhood, the morning of his life, in his early years, those ministers, the Yemenaras who are around him in those times, that's the Sarecha Baboka Yachelu. They eat him up. They oppress him. They criticize him. They knock him. They complain about him, say, Why are you being so childish? What's the matter with you? You're the prince. Act like a prince. You're the king now. Act like a king. What are you playing with the crown for? Stop it. And they, God forbid, these people, the ministers, but Baika Shalai, in his childhood, eat him up. Umagdilo Kahar, Mikshoilov Haktonim, Kachuta Saira. And they build his little stupidities as a child into a mountain. They make a fuss over it. They make it bigger than it ever was in the first place. They exaggerate it. You say, so, Chinuch. Chinuch. He's got to know. Got to know. You got to tell him. Can't play with the scepter. As Terim Yazkin. Then before he becomes of age, they've dried out his spirit. And no one will benefit from him at all. It's impossible for a child not to be childish. Are we crazy? What is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? We look at a child and we tell them, stop acting childish. I mean, what do we say? Why are you behaving like that? 
Why can't you act grown up? Because I'm seven. Twenty-seven. <laughs> when you think about it, neuroscience tells us the brain development on average doesn't finish till 26. That means up until 26, they're lacking completion of their brain. When I work with kids, I frequently and respectfully ask them the following question, and we get a good laugh. I tell them, neuroscience says that your brain is not developed fully. This is the good news, I tell them. I got a 16-year-old sitting in front of me, does drugs, some halashabas. You know, he's got a weird, interesting haircut. He may even have interesting letters shaved into the back of his head, piercings, tattoos, you name it. And I tell him, oh, I got such good news for you. He says, what's that? I say, how old are you? 16. Terrific. Brain development, standard normative brain development doesn't complete till 26. It's good news. You got 10 more years. So he looks at me and thinks, okay, that sounds good. Someone's speaking to me nicely, you know, got 10 years. So I say to him, can I ask you a question? It's a 16-year-old question. It's not a 26-year-old question. You should be able to get this one. He says, okay. And I say, well, if your brain is developing and it's not fully developed for another 10 years, what do you think's missing? And they look at me. It's fascinating. It's the first time it ever occurred to them such a concept. Because let's be honest. Well, he's 16, so but if he was 15 then sure, there is nothing he doesn't know. Let's be honest. 15. They should have a little bat button for 15 years. Ask me now while I'm still 15. Because essentially there's nothing I don't know at 15, right? At 16, he can embrace the fact that there's maybe something he doesn't know. But it's a fascinating concept. You've got 10 more years, so what do you think's missing? I say it with a smile, and they look at me, ha ha. This guy's interesting. I don't know. You tell me. But I got their interest. I say, well, look, here's the good news. The good news is that every single thing you know, everything, you're going to know better and deeper in 10 years from now. Isn't that great news? That means you're entitled to be a little nutty. Is that okay? And they always start laughing. You're entitled. You're 16. Your brain hasn't fully developed. How, Hashem Yerachem, should we expect a 16-year-old to be acting like a person who has a 26-year-old brain that's fully developed? And not so, a 26-year-old who didn't experience trauma. Are we crazy? We're nuts. That's begeda bebet besarecha beboike yachelu that we push and destroy them. It's impossible for a child not to be childish. We have to allow that to be. We have to laugh at it. We have to understand it. Just like the little kid who toddles around the house and wrecks your home. And I always say, take out the camera. You know, people have come over to me. It's hilarious. Since I'm saying this, people WhatsApp me and they show me pictures of drawings on walls. You know, Cheerios being thrown on your head. Take pictures. Show them to the Shevabrachas. I'm telling you, it's Moiradik. But we have to allow our children to be children. It's impossible for them not to be. Who are we, the chutzpah of it, that we expect of them to be something they can't be and they're not? And then we dry them out, like the Chasim Sefer says, Terim Yazkin, before they get there, they're so turned off because we didn't allow them to be children. Let's allow them to be kids. Let's free them to be who they are and have expectations that are appropriate based on their age and their development. Let me say a few words about personal building this resilient home 
personal. I said this in Tiberia, and I got uh, very positive feedback, so I'm going to repeat this, the personal stuff. Live your life in a way that when your children think of integrity, of courage, of kindness, they think of you. Live your life in a way. Yeah. That when your children think of courage, integrity, and kindness, they think of you. Let that sink in. The challenge of it alone brings tears to my eyes. This is what our kids deserve from us. What does it mean? Let's break it down. What does courage mean? The courage means the courage to do what's right for your kid and not for you. Not to do what's right for your ego, for your prestige, for your respect, for your worry about Shidduchim, which is, by the way, Shalai Al Pitaira, because I call it Shabbat, Mizavik, Zvilgim, and Abraham Yom Kaidi, Messiah, Zablad, Yod, Sebaskab, Abbas, Bas, Plonil, Bay, you already have a Shidduch, they already have their Shidduchim, just got to find them. It's so negative, it's so opposite to Torah Shkapa. We have to do the courage to us right. Your kid is struggling. The greatest courageous act we do is when they're dressed the way they dress and their hair and their piercings and all the rest of it and you go to the local store with them hand in hand with your arm around them. Have the courage to put your child first, not yourself first. It takes courage. One thing I'll tell you, every single person who ever did it discovered afterwards when their friends called them or people saw them and they said, you're awesome. Where did you find the courage and strength to do that? I was so impressed. Everyone has experienced that. Have the courage to love your children and put their needs first, not yours. Have the courage to admit to yourself that I made horrible mistakes because I didn't know. Have the courage to let that in, let that really sink in. I made terrible mistakes. My ego got in the way. I was stuck. I was stuck and locked up with my ego. Or perhaps I just never heard the information. Perhaps I didn't understand it and seek to understand it. Have the courage to admit to yourself, I made mistakes. I made lots of them. And if necessary, have the courage to admit that to your child. Have the courage to look them in the face and say, I messed up. I didn't do it deliberately, but I did. I've said it to all my children. But I can tell you this, my kids love me. Because of it, I think. Even though I've acknowledged my mistakes. And I continue to do so. There's probably nothing sweeter for our own development than to admit we were wrong. Have the courage to face it and admit it. Have the courage to believe and realize that that which we were doing is not working. And if it's not working, stop it. Find something else. Have the courage to embrace. We made a lot of mistakes for a lot of time and that made a lot of hurt and damage in our children and may need many, many years to recover from. Have the courage to admit it. Have the courage to put your child in the school they belong, not the one that fits your ego, family system, grandparents, relatives, neighbors admiring you, but put them in a school where they fit, whatever that school may be, in the environment they need, not the one your ego needs. Have the courage to put them in the right place. 
early, immediately, right away. Don't hesitate, don't wait. Maybe we won't need Waterbury. Like, get over it. Get over it. That's supposed to go to Waterbury. It's an amazing thing to be there. If that's the right place for that child, that's the best yeshiva on earth. That's their brisk. That's their BJJ. Have the courage to see that. You see, it's all about getting over the ego. It's getting yourself out of the way and seeing what's right for the kids. Have the courage to see that. Integrity. I heard this marvelous thing one time. A drasha from a Usher Weiss, Shlita, on the subject of Abderecha It was a beautiful drasha. And in that drasha, he cleared the following statement. He said, it's interesting, Rabbi Kiba says, Ze klal godel b'tayra. He doesn't say ze mitzvah g'dayla b'tayra. It's not a mitzvah g'dayla. It's a klal godel. What's the difference? Fascinating question. And he said this. It was amazing. It was a shocker. He said it because it's not just a mitzvah in the Torah. It's a klal godel of the whole Torah. Which means whatever you do in mitzvahs, Make sure it stems with Vahavtarecha Kamecha. Make sh- it's a clown goddle in Tyra. It's a prerequisite. If you're doing a mitzvah at the expense of someone else's feelings, then you're not doing Tyra. Let that sink in. If your humras your desire to keep your humras on mazik, your child, hurt them, trigger them, drive them away, it doesn't stem with ba'afterecha kamaycha. Go ask a rav if you can drop your humras. Like Rav Shroth said this morning, when you have children around you who are hurting or running away from Yiddishkeit, go to the bottom place in halacha that exists. Find the most lenient, easiest. I remember when our children started struggling. We in our home, we were chal of Yisrael, we were past Yisrael. Like most Yiddish homes. And when my children hit bar mitzvah, bas mitzvah, I told them, you're potter from this. You're potter. If you don't want challah you saw, you want regular challah stam, you want to eat Entenmann's poppins. They love those. I have still not eaten an Entenmann poppin, but I think I would if they really wanted me to. But I told them, it's your choice. My humras should not be on the expense of your life. You don't keep any of my humras if they hurt you. Torah has to stim with Ba'afterecha Kamaicha. We have to find a way to make sure that we never hurt anyone, especially our children, with the stress and tension around our humras, around our Torah. I think it's a brilliant insight and it's a helpful way to process life. I had a bacha came into me. This happened last year, right about this time. He told me he hates the three weeks. He hates the three weeks. Hates it. So I figured, you know, I don't like it either. Frankly, I'm like an Easternist. I like a shower. You know, I'm not like, uh, yeah. And I like meat. You know, what can I do? I like a good steak. You know, he tells me he hates the, the three weeks. And I, you know, most of us can relate to it. I don't think we enjoy the three weeks. Not something anyone looks forward to. And he said, no, none of that. I'm fine with that. I said, so what do you hate about the three weeks? And he got really activated, really, really activated and angry. 
and he was crying angrily as he described to me how every single year since he's been in yeshiva in his life, everyone dashens, the same drasha. Why didn't we rebuild the base Hamikdash in our door? Was the Gemara say, because obviously we still have the same sin as Chinam. We have to get over sin as Chinam. We have to get over it, and everyone dashens. The we right cold door. And then he tells me, do you know how much sin as Chinam I experience every day of my life? Being criticized, put down, blamed for things, expectations of me for things I can't do. He gave me a list of the sinus chinam he experiences all the time, the things he sees in front of him from the same people dashing. That it's because we still have sinus chinam, we don't have the ways of English. Integrity demands that if we're going to say it, let's live it, let's be it. Let's do it. Let's get rid of sinus chinam. What I said last night, when people responded to the word kindness and told me that as much as gemachim and chesed we have everywhere, oh, but where's the kindness? Where's the interpersonal kindness? That's what our children need to feel. It's what we have to bring into our homes, sensitivity and kindness. Instead of the criticism, the control, how many of us grew up, unfortunately, from homes where, unfortunately, that's how our parents came through the war, came through the world, and they were critical. They were traumatized. We, it, it became a shita in chinuch. It wasn't a shita in chinuch. It was trauma. It was straight-up trauma. They were edgy. They were anxious. They were scared. And somehow we grew up with that, and it became part of our DNA, Kindness. That's the integrity. If we're going to live with, if we're going to go into the three weeks, let's live that life of no sin, of gentleness and kindness to each other. We've done the cuffs close to be You know, I said before, admit to yourself when you're wrong. I want to tell you a very painful and personal story of something I once admitted. This is integrity, I think. So I had a Mishigas once. Most men do. I don't know how many men once decided I'm going to make my own wine. It's a nutty thing. I think it's a stage men go through. You know, we buy all the paraphernalia, the gallon bottles, we sterilize the thing with all that, the whole business with the thing. You know, we're like very like shimer on it. And we produce the greatest vinegar you can imagine. <laughs> we're really good at vinegar. I realized in my attempt for this, I don't know, it's a mysterious rite of passage of men. You know, like somewhere in your 30s, you have to make your own wine, you know, and then bottle it for Purim and give it out. You know, Reuben steam wine, you know, it's like... Anyway, I did this Mishigas and then realized what a total Bittles money it was. It was crazy the time I was mashkia, this stupid wine. I confess I was considering walking on the grapes in the bathtub. <laughs> Have you ever seen someone take those blue gloves and put them on your feet? <laughs> Stand in the bathtub on your, on your grapes? I gave it up, but I had the gallon jars, and I had a minag, and I had a savings. Every Friday, Erev Shabbos, I took all the coins in my pockets, coins, whatever coins were there, and I put them in this jar. And when the jar was full, it took sometimes, I don't know, six months, a year, it was full, took it to the bank, $100 bills, put them in the bottom, and did it again. And I'm thinking, I don't know, a chasna, a retirement, it's an easy savings. You don't notice it. It's just like loose change. And I figured this will be a good savings. And I kept it in the closet in my bedroom on the floor. And over the years, it built up. I have no idea how much money was in there. One day, my wife and I went away from home. 
for a weekend. Kids were there, and they're friends of the house, and they took the bottle. They took the money, which I discovered later was used to buy drugs, and I was really hurt. I can't tell you. It was a very large amount of money, and I was really hurt. And I was really angry, actually, for a long, long time. I at least tried to live the values I tried to preach, and I never asked them who did it. And I don't know to this day who took it. It took everything out of me. I felt so hurt and betrayed. I did so much for them. And this, you take my jar. And it was a lot of money. Over the years, it kind of ate away at me. I realized it was in me. It was strange. I was bothered about it, but I never asked them. I never brought it up to them. Until one day, Kodesh Baruch Hu gave me relief, and I realized something so profound. That's where the uh, emotion is coming from, because I realized I was at fault, not them. I realized I was over a derisa of Lifneiva Los Temichel. I was over the derisa. My self righteousness and hurt and anger was absolutely wrong. But at that point, I informed my children and asked Mechila from them, for whoever took it, who may be still hurting and embarrassed about it. I don't want to know who took it but I do want to apologize for putting it there in front of you in the first place. That was an Issa Dereisa in my house, Mathila. Freed me. We frequently do things to set up our children, and their reactions are really a consequence of what we did and then we blame them. Shem Yerashim. Integrity means owning that, admitting that to ourselves, embracing that and accepting that. That's integrity. Kindness, courage, integrity, and kindness. Kindness is such a powerful thing, kindness. We keep mentioning it. Kindness, it means respecting the right of someone else to be them, not you. It means talking to someone in a way that conveys deep respect. You're at Salam Elohim. Our children are Tzalem Elohim. When we talk to them, we're talking to a Tzalem Elohim. Would you criticize the Tzalem Elohim? You would criticize Hashem? Would you get short-tempered, frustrated, angry? Your spouse, your children, your friends, they're at Tzalem Elohim. They deserve kindness. Especially your children, when we have to do the norms of life. See, I'm not a liberal. I believe that we're meant to do the structure, the rules, the discipline. We're meant to. is part of life. But guess what? It works perfectly when you do it with kindness. You don't have to be angry. That's a door gone by. The Chaisek shifted Sonya Benoy Mishli Gimel, that world is a world 
for the most part gone. Today's world, of course we do structure, of course we do rules and discipline, of course we have to teach our kids Gadarim and life and all the rest of it. But what a world of difference. Just try it when you do it with kindness, when you lose the angry face, when you smile at them, when you show them, I'm doing this for you, Shekla. This is not for me. I'm not hurt. I'm not upset with you. I have a responsibility to care for you. I have a responsibility to teach you age appropriate how to grow up and be helped, how to be other centered. We do it with kindness. It's so much easier to do it with frustration and anger. You know, that's quick and easy. It's so easy just to criticize. It's so easy, unfortunately, for many of us simply to do whatever our parents programmed into us, the thing that we always swore we'd never do. Remember that when we got married under the chuppah? Should please help me. Let me take the best of my parents. Let me leave behind the other stuff. You know, that's pshat. In la'ulam ya'zav ishes aviv behimai. You know, pshat, it's a fa- fascinating lotion. La'ulam ya'zav, ayzav. Leave them, abandon your parents. It's kind of a weird lotion, no? So I hope pshat once from... This comes from a Rav, or Frankel. He was the Rav Tel Aviv at the time of the beginning of the Medina. And he said, this is Pshat. Amazing. He says, Tati Mashma. L'olam Yazo. It's too stark. It means like this. Those who know Hebrew well will understand. Ya'azoiv is related to the word Izavon. Izavon is Yerusha. It's what you leave over. La'azov. You leave it over is upon. La ayanom yazav ishes obivimus tati mashma. Be ayazav, leave behind the stuff that you know was dysfunctional from the war, was trauma based, didn't work. Leave it behind. But take with the izavon, the best of your parents. Take that with you into your life. Because everyone has the best stuff from their parents too. Kindness. Don't intimidate someone to win an argument. Don't raise your voice. Raise your argument. Raise the level and content of your thoughts. Don't raise your voice. On the contrary, every single person knows that people listen better when you speak softer. I've noticed myself over the years, my voice has changed. My voice changed. It became softer. I speak slower. Speak with kindness. Act with kindness. Look with kindness. We have a smile for a reason. Use your smile. Don't intimidate your kids into behavior. Don't threaten them by your body language, by your facial expression. On the contrary, stay with the rules and the structure if you have to. But do it with kindness. Do it with softness. Do it in a way that the kids clearly know this is for you, not me. I'm just trying to help you be healthy. And lastly, religious. Don't scare your children into mitzvahs. Don't threaten your kids to feel they're going to lose their ulam haba. Terrify them, frighten them. We have to live a life, a Torah life, this basimcha. It's a pella, we just don't all smile more. You noticed it's like such a pella. Why, why don't we smile more? We should smile when we do mitzvahs. We should enjoy doing mitzvahs and smile. 
And I hope that idea that we shared both here this morning, that you're not chayev to force your kids to do mitzvahs. You're chayev to teach them the parameters and try to inspire them to want to do it. But there's no force there's no compliance. You know, the best thing you can do with mitzvahs is enjoy doing them yourself. The greatest thing you can ever bring your children about mitzvahs is your geschmack when you do it. In all the years, and all the crises my wife and I went through, we never compromised ever our own shmirs our mitzvahs. There may have been bad days, that's true. But our shmiras and mitzvahs was us. We just carried on doing our thing. But doing it in a way that was happy. Just happy. Enjoy it. Don't preach. Don't dash and don't pressure. Don't force. Ever. Certainly don't dash and about it. Just enjoy it. Smile. Be happy doing mitzvahs around our kids. That's what they need to see. Anyway, Mr. Satara comes through relationship, doesn't come through your dear. No kids, you know, all these kids, I interview them later in life. They're in their 30s. They're barely from anymore. And then they're in therapy with me for one reason or another. And they're barely from, they hung in there. Somehow they found a way to hang in there with Shmir Samitsis. And I ask them, so it's an amazing thing. Happens all the time. It's incredible. And I ask them, so tell me, they tell me, they pour out their sorrows about all the years in yeshiva and high school and seminary and how bad it was and terrible it was and they just felt really maruchuk and damaged and hurt. They tell you all their sorrows. But I say, it's so interesting, with all that hardship, I see you're still from, you still kept something. Was there ever a rabbi or teacher who was actually very good to you? Was there ever one? And everyone says yes. Oh, my sixth grade Rebbe, wow. If not for him, I wouldn't be from. I would not be from if not for him. He was amazing. He was this, he was that. My fourth grade teacher, she was outstanding. She was incredible. They all have one teacher or Rebbe in their years in yeshiva, and that's why I'm from today. They say it. I'm only from because of her or because of him. So I listened to her. I said, wow, it's amazing. And they can I ask you one thing. This is not a beginner. Don't, like, freak out, you know. Can I ask you one question? They say, sure. I say, so this person is why you're from today. Your Torah and mitzvahs that you do is because of that person, right? They say, yes, absolutely. Well, could you tell me one thing they taught you? Do you remember one thing? One. And they all go blank. I say, it's not beginner. It's okay. Don't worry. Not testing you. And they look at it, and they say, no, actually, they can't remember one thing. And I say, isn't that amazing? You're from, your Torah mitzvahs are intact. You still keep Shabbos because of that person, and you can't remember one single thing they ever taught you. Half of a fella. Because Masoris HaTorah comes through relationship, not through your dear. True Messiah Satoy comes because you want it. You feel connected to it. It's the relationship of love and kindness and connectedness. And when we bring that simchas mitzvahs of joy without forcing, without pressuring, without criticizing, you know, worried about their hat, you know, you got to have your hat on like, you know, you know how many people fight because it's on a tilt. You know, why? Don't wear it like that. And that's the bummy people wear it like, you know, wear it straight. It's all crazy stuff. So satiric comes through relationship with us, and it comes through a relationship with an authentic parent, teacher who loves and enjoys doing it. That's how we are meant to approach religion with our children. Someone asked me, I'm going to finish with this thought. I'm going to finish with this. But someone asked me, Few people ask me, you know, we've had six children over the years that struggled. It's been a long journey. How do we survive? We seem so happy. People ask us all the time, you seem, you're always smiling, Russell. I was with you. Are you on drugs? (laughs) 
<laughs> Not even psychedelics, trust me. So they asked me how I survived, but I put some thought to it. I actually wondered about it, but I want to show you what I think how I survived, and my wife and I survived, and how we survived. And this is the take-home thought from this conference. I think it's the last thing I'm saying. And maybe we can take this home with us. There's a Pasek in Tillin. We all know the Pasek. We davened Shabbos morning. Mishpati Hashem Emes. Tzot Kuyachto. Mishpati Hashem Emes. Tzot Kuyachto. When you look at them all together, the whole Torah, Tzot they're righteous together. It's the simple Pshat. The Chavaz Chaim says a different Pshat. I want to tell you what his Pshat is. And it's what nurtured, it's what held me. It's I'm like, in a way, a strap hanger on the subway of life with all the ups and downs holding on to this. Gemara, we're going to learn this Gemara shortly. This Gemara in Gittin, on Ches. We're going to learn this Gemara. We usually learn it now during the three weeks. The Gemara tells us of the very, very tragic tale it's a very sad story of Yishmol ben Elisha, the Kohen Godel, at the time of the Chorban Bias. It's such a, such a tragic story that the Bias was destroyed and his children, he had two children, son and a daughter, were taken into captivity. They were beautiful children, the Gemara says. The girl was stunning, beautiful, the boy was handsome, amazing, and two different slave owners took them into captivity, leaving the Kohen Godel hiding in sorrow. Loss of the base Amikdash, his life, family, Yushalayim destroyed, and his two children taken into captivity. These two slave owners, one day were talking about all the slaves they took from Jerusalem. And one mentioned, I have the most beautiful girl, slave. You can't imagine. Never saw such a beautiful creature. And the other one says, so interesting. I happen to have the most beautiful slave, a man. He's so handsome. So they came up with an idea. Let's put them together, these two slaves, and we'll have them create more children. And the children will for sure be beautiful. And this way we can sell the children as slaves and we'll have a lot more money. Do you think it's a good idea? They mask him to this idea. So one night, they put these two slaves together in a room and they tell them what they expect them to do. It's such a tragic tale. So the son went to one corner of the room and said to himself, I, the son of the Kohen Godel, I should be chayta, I should go and be with her. Slave girl, no way. And he sat in the corner of the room and cried. She said to herself, I, the daughter of the coin god, I should be metamit myself with some slave, no way. And she went into another corner of the room and she cried. And the two cried through the night, separated from each other. When dawn broke and light came through the window, they saw each other. And they realized who they were. And the two children embraced and cried. And in their Bechia, their Nishamas went back to Shemayim. Such a tragic story. Such a sad story. Shemayim Kangadu, his children, they both died in this tragic, tragic way. The Marambi panel fills in the missing parts to this story. That our face value leaves us in pain until the Marambi panel reveals the rest of the story. It was a Makubal, 15, 1600s. And this is what he says. David the Melech, we know, had 18 wives. Gwar says. One of his wives, her name was Maka, he took her when he was in a war. They went into battle, and he saw Yefastoya, he saw her on the battlefield, and he took her as a wife. 
And the Gemara says that the halacha is in the midst of the battle of the passions of battle, he's allowed to be with her one time. But afterwards, she needs to become a geiris, go through geiris, and then he can take her with, as a wife if he wishes. But one time he's allowed in the midst of the battle, or the end of the battle. And David the Melch took this marker, and he was with her, and she got pregnant and had a child before the geiris. The name was Tama. Now, amongst his other children, he had a son of Shalom. Everyone knows that. And this Toma was Avshalom's sister. Avshalom was a child of Maka after the Geras. And this Toma was his sister before the Geras. Halachically, technically, is a deal if she was really Jewish because it was before the Geras, was she indeed the sister or not? But Avshalom called her his sister. Amongst the other wives, he had a son, Amnon. And this son, Amnon, took a cheshik for Toma. She was apparently exceedingly beautiful. Say the Mephoshim, the Redak, speaks it out, that she was exceedingly beautiful. And Amnon fell for his half-sister. That was, they were, they had the same father. They had different mothers. And technically, she was born before she was really, she wasn't a garrus. It's a technical halachic issue. But the Chazal looked at it as a chet. Because Amnon conspired. He was so taken with her beauty. He was overwhelmed with desire for her. And he cleverly found a way to entrap her privately, talk her into being with him, and he slept with her. And it was a chet godl l'oid, considered by Chazal, a chet godl l'oid. Because it was his half-sister. Zod the Maram Bipano, the Kodesh who took those two neshamas after they died, Amnon and Tama, and held them, waiting to see how he could help them repair the chet. He brought them back as the children of the Kohen Godel of Ishmael ben Alisha. And they were together in that room and told to be together. And they weren't. And they weren't. And in the Bechia, their Nishamas departed because they'd fulfilled the reason they were in this world. Listen to the Chofetz Chaim's pshot. Zog the Chofetz Chaim. Mishpate Hashem Tzedek. The Mishpat and the judgments of Hashem on us in our lives are Tzedek. But they're only Tzad Kuyachtov. You can only say that Tzedek when you see each Gilgul, each generation, the real full picture. Then Tzad Kuyachtov. When you see every time what's happening, the real background picture of Hashem's plan, then you can say Sadku. It's Sadku Yachtov Zod the Chavitz Chaim. Isn't that amazing? I believe I try to live my life with the awareness of Sadku Yachtov. The children Hashem gifted us were there to make me who I am to take me to a place I wouldn't have got to otherwise. Our children, each one of us, are brought to us in this Gilgal for them and for you. They are our gift, our heritage. They're there to take us to the place we have to get to that we can't get to otherwise. Because Mishpate Hashem Tzedek, Emes Tzadkuyachtov, we could only see it when you see each Gilgal, then you'd understand. In the meantime, we go with the Muna, we embrace it. That's my strap I hang on to. And I share it with you in the hope that you can hang on to that strap too. And that together, 
we can help our children and help ourselves. Each one of us find our purpose and meaning as we help our children find theirs. Thank you very much, everyone. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.